Michael Vassar. And um, then we have uh, Olaf Witkowski, who has started this really intriguing lab, Cross Labs, over in Tokyo. And then we have Andrew Briggs from Oxford, who is the chair of nanomaterials. Is that right? So this is a good panel. And just from talking to everybody, there's a tremendous amount of controversy. So nobody in the panel wants to just go for like 10 minutes and then go to the next person. They want to actually interact. So I'm going to start, though, by going straight to Michael um, to give us some background. Michael, um, what's your feeling about whether there'll be a singularity and what a singularity involves? So there's a bunch of different things, like very different things, that people have called a singularity in a technological context. The first uh, meaning that people came up with was a sort of positive feedback loop, whereby if intelligent systems are used to make more intelligent systems, for instance, humans making machines that can do all of the things that human brains can do and more, we, we might expect that to have a positive feedback loop unless unless there's some rapid depletion of low-hanging fruit, where like humans are very close to somehow being the optimally intelligent system, even if there are no qualitatively more intelligent systems than we are, even if there are merely quantitatively more intelligent systems, uh, if the quantities involved are pretty large, we should expect that there's a very rapid transition from a world wh which has been dominated by human intelligence to a world dominated by machine intelligence. So apparently von Neumann and Stanislaw Ulam talked about this in private correspondence in the 50s, using the word singularity, interestingly. And I.J. Good talked about it using the word intelligence explosion in the 60s. But Werner Winge started writing science fiction about the idea in the 70s, but discussed it a little bit more analytically, also using the word singularity in 91, where he tries to, being a little more analytic, uh, appeal to sort of a logical model, where he's basically saying that human intelligence has been the driver of history, human intelligence organized in a, some sort of a network structure, some sort of an architecture, and that as we develop better machines and ways of modifying human intelligence, we should expect between around 2005 and 2030 for the driver of history to be replaced by some other driver of history, which is more intelligent, has more optimization potential. And um, so we're right in the middle of the period that Vinge is identifying with the singularity. And um, a lot of people do kind of see old structures of intelligence breaking down, like the old military and governmental structures. And a lot of people see a lot of potential, I would say, for new radically more intelligent structures to arise from humans collaborating with other people, with machines, uh, analyzing biochemistry, analyzing genomes. But we don't necessarily have a lot of institutional construction of more intelligent systems yet. And um, then there are like very dumbed down conceptions of the singularity that focus around Moore's law and increasingly powerful computing hardware. And that seems very unlikely to be relevant, partly because Moore's law seems to be coming to an end. Um, things like quantum computing might help to build a AI, but we can probably get very powerful narrow AI without quantum computing. And there's nothing like a guarantee that quantum computing will give us a GI. So, I mean, with a powerful enough quantum computer or classical computer, you can probably just simulate brains. But that's probably not going to be how we get greater than human intelligence. So, mostly when we're thinking about a singularity, we're talking about either this sort of continuous transition that we're in the heart of, or the point at the end where you um, have machines making more powerful machines. So that was very helpful. And now I know that there are a lot of people on the panel who are concerned with how we even get there from here. Uh, you know, people who are worried about things like um, algorithmic discrimination, black box problem, all bunch of, a whole bunch of things. So I'll start with Andrew and then move to Surya. How do we get there from here? So, so thanks, Susan. So, you know, the question we were asked to address is, will we hit an AI singularity? <clears throat> Which I suppose people sort of mean, will AI, you know, take over the Earth, rather like um, the meek shall inherit the Earth, if that's all right with the rest of you. And uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. We might think about what, what kinds of, um, 
advances there will be in AI, but your question, Susan, is where do we go from here and how do we proceed towards that? And I think that's really important because like so many other of the technological advances that are galloping apace, it comes down to real questions of what are humans for and what are our ultimate values and why are we here? And I think with the AI, we're going to need both, um, to use George Ellis's terms in a different context, uh, downward causation and upward causation. The downward causation comes from thinking about AI as a natural resource. And we know from uh, plenty of the history of the 20th century that if you have a natural resource and you don't have good governance, then the natural resource does not lead to prosperity. It leads to uh, inequality and uh, hardship and tears at best and to bloodshed at worst. And we've seen that in plenty of African countries. We've seen a rather good use of the governance of natural resources in Norway. And if you think of um, AI as a natural resource which can be mined with potentially huge benefits, if it's mined without the good governance in place first, then it won't bring the prosperity that it could promise at best. <clears throat> So that's the sort of downward causation. How you do it, of course, is a very hard question, but at least we can recognize the need. And then the upward causation will be the kind of uh, qualities and virtues that individuals need to develop in order to be able to live well in uh, a world where there's an increasing amount of decision-making being taken by machines. I hope we'll discuss that a bit more on the panel, but perhaps that gets the discussion started. Excellent. And Surya, um, can you talk about some of the concrete challenges that you see happening already involving algorithms, fairness, ethics, justice? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, I think, to talk about a, a singularity in humans, sorry, sorry, machines becoming faster than humans recreating themselves, potentially taking over the Earth. But I think there's a lot more proximal issues that we really need to worry about, and the hype about the machines taking over the Earth sucks the air out of these much more proximal and much more pressing issues that we really need to deal with. Uh, I actually taught a class on uh, uh, AI entrepreneurship and society at Stanford where we dealt, dealt with a lot of these issues, and some of the ones that came up were you know, things that really impact the quality of human life. For example, human attention is our most precious resource. Attention, the ability to attend to our loved ones is what keeps families together, keeps the fabric of society together. You have all these AI systems, recommendation engines, ad targeting systems at companies whose express purpose is to capture human attention. And therefore, we take it away from other things that we should care about and that would, would contribute to our happiness. How do we incentivize companies to stop doing that? It's against their DNA to do that. What do we do about that? Uh, the future of work, AI is dramatically changing the nature of jobs. You know, we have the gig economy, Uber drivers, uh, the gig economy has taken over in Silicon Valley with, uh, you know, grocery delivery and all that kind of stuff. Is this a race to the bottom? What do we do about jobs going forward? The rate of takeover of jobs and the food chain or the, the height of the food chain in which jobs can be replaced now is getting so high and so rapid retraining is not going to be feasible on the short time scale and the transience that we may we may experience on the way to reorienting our economy could be very devastating uh, should we think should we be thinking about universal basic income now um, regulation if a self-driving car hits somebody who's to who's to blame who, who gets sued more generally, what ethics do we want to put in our self-driving cars if they're forced between two terrible alternatives of, you know, killing this many young people or this many old people? How does it decide? How do we program that in? Um, inherent bias in AI systems, there are these language models that can uh, learn how to predict the next word in a sentence. You can ask it questions and it'll answer it questions. Uh, this is kind of close to home. If you ask these language models, what nationality is a professor, it will say Indian. If you ask the same language model, what nationality, what, what ethnicity is a gardener, it'll say Hispanic. 
Okay? That's a bias that's specific even to California, right? Um, gender biases, it'll say a man is a banker whereas a woman is a homemaker. These biases are in the training data themselves. If we don't want AI systems to repeat the mistakes of our past, we have to feed at training data that doesn't consist of our past. How do we do that? Um, and, and finally, all, about this, all this talk about a singularity, I'm not so worried about it because deep networks are dumb. I mean, they're idiotic. Uh, you can fool them with these very trivial adversarial examples that are imperceptible to a human. Um, you take away certain cues from the training data, they stop working. Um, I, I have this gut feeling that everything we're doing in AI right now, if say the moon were general intelligence, what we're doing in AI is like climbing a tree to get to the moon. And uh, we're going to have to eventually rethink everything we're doing. So anyway, those are my thoughts. So we definitely agree that deep networks are dumb and are not going to get there, even if I'm not confident at all that we're going to have to rethink everything we're doing. Like I expect probably we're going to learn quite a few things in the process of developing deep networks that will be relevant to AGI, but we don't know what and we don't know how much else there is to learn. And I think we definitely agree that right now there are some very important questions that need to be worked on, think, having to do with things like social media and control of our attention. I'm going to mention one that Kissinger mentioned in his recent article, which is actually something like the reduction in prestige associated with intelligence. He talked about how like, if chess writing program games can beat humans, that reduces the prestige of intelligence some, but if we can have articles written by machines, this increases, reduces the prestige of intelligence more, and that potentially will lead to less overall control and overall ability to make good decisions at the level of, of our society. My general take is that the big picture long-term problem is mostly interesting because it's extremely analytical. Like, it's not really a problem that reasonable people can disagree with. Like, it, it's just analytically true that we have no idea how to build an AI that has general intelligence, but also analytically true that if we did have an idea how to build an AI with general intelligence, we would have no idea of how to control it, no idea even how to make progress towards knowing how to control it. That's great. And can you tell people about the control problem? I mean, very generally, Normally, we tend to describe what we're doing or in terms of actor models, which a number of people have talked about before, in terms of decision theories where some sort of a utility function is being maximized. And that basically boils down to a rank ordering of possible states that the universe could be in. But as an actual matter of fact, we don't have a rank ordering of possible states that the universe could be in in our heads. I don't have strong opinions about what things ought to be done, and I wouldn't want to lock in all future generations into the, decision, the best decisions that I could make right now. So we don't have any way of really thinking rigorously about the process whereby we arrive at our preferences, well, I et cetera. Was, I was trying to get at a, just a simple explanation of the control problem, because I thought you were kind of moving in that direction where, you know, I think it's important that people understand that when we're looking at the question, how do we get there from here, one of the biggest issues that we face is, could we potentially be outmoded by AI to the point where, in fact, we even lose control of AI? And how would humans maintain parity with artificial intelligence? Is Olaf, maybe I could get you in there. I know you've been working on varieties of intelligences. I mean, do you have any ideas about uh, that issue? Do you think it's a serious issue or not? And, what varieties of intelligent minds might we uh, encounter during a singularity? Before that, uh, I want to address this, okay. this control and, and dumb AI right now. And indeed, it's, it's, it's quite dumb if you work on a daily basis with AI. Well, it cannot do so much. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to think about the future, for sure, okay. because they are very important ethical uh, questions. But there are fears that we're bu building up, including in the uh, the specialist community uh, of machine learning, uh, fears of control, um, so, so the, the dual control problem where um, uh, not only we couldn't control the AI, but the AI could control us. So, so if they can, could, could control and predict uh, accurately, uh, very accurately, uh, the effects of uh, tweeting feeds, uh, for example, uh, they can control uh, humanity that way. And, uh, and, and th that's, that's, that, those are both problems. 
there are all other fears, like uh, fears of shrinkage. Uh, uh, Avi at uh, IAS in Princeton uh, gave a fun talk about how he thought that because of, of, of AI technology um, taking over more and more functions uh, that are cognitively uh, inherently human right now, we would uh, shrink our uh, cognitive ability. And I don't think that is quite true, for example, uh, because there are so many technologies that expand our, uh, our intelligence effectively. And, uh, well, there is an example of the abacus or uh, mathematical theorems. We invent them and we extend our understanding of the universe. So I think uh, those, those, those kind of, those kind of uh, aspects uh, are kind of forgotten when you fear uh, AI as a technology. What I would suggest as, as an alternative is um, studying the integration of technology uh, with uh, human society instead, something like communication with technology, uh, studying how we can couple with the tool. And this is uh, something we have formalisms to study. I would, I would like to... I'm sorry, I think Andrew had his hand up earlier. Yeah. I, I find that very helpful, Olav. And, and I'm wondering if it may also be helpful to <clears throat> make a distinction uh, between technical decision-making and moral decision making and the moral decision making in a rather broad sense you know life choices that we make and in the technical decision making i think we can expect the machines to get better and better at it and to be extremely effective so that could be decisions like in my laboratory what to measure next how to tune up a device uh, it could be on a power grid which power stations to bring online and so on uh, I think we're rather happy with the machines taking better and better decisions about those kinds of things. There may even be decisions that affect humans. So, for example, the airlines uh, in British Airways, uh, the machine learning decides on the crew schedules, and it does a rather good job of it. And then we can think of uh, other decisions which are moral decision-making, uh, choices that we make for ourselves, but they can be choices that we make for society as well, the kind of choices where uh, political and democratic processes are important on whatever scale. And our experience of humans doing moral decision making is that the rational component is just that, it's a component and that there needs to be what you can loosely call an emotional or an affective component. And um, it, it seems that where you get humans whose rational decision-making capabilities are unimpaired, but for some reason are clinically disconnected from their affective selves, they don't actually live terribly well. They don't make very good moral decisions. And in fact, in many cases, uh, it's almost as if uh, decisions and choices and commitments are made for reasons that are other than rational, and then if they're educated and clever and articulate people, they're rather good at rationalizing that and using their linguistic powers to try to persuade others to come along with them in the choice that they've make and made for good or for bad. It can work either way. And so I guess as we go forward with the machines taking increasing numbers of decisions for us, it may be helpful to recognize that distinction, to give probably a rather unqualified welcome to the machines getting better and better at taking the technical decisions for us, but to think rather carefully how we're going to work with the machines in what I've called the moral decision-making processes. So let me interject with a question then to follow up on that. So um, there is this issue in deep learning, the black box problem, right? And ha I mean, even with these fairly simple deep learning systems, seems very difficult to find out exactly what the processes are, right? And these systems are data-driven, and we've already noted from Surya's comment that if the data is infected or biased, even if the decision is about something as seemingly bland as how to schedule employees for work or to make a mortgage decision, you could get intrinsic bias. So what I want to know is what do we do as we move into the future as these AI systems get even more and more complex to deal with 
the lack of transparency in these AI systems. And I think Olaf had a finger up. And then I'll, I'd like to chip in after. OK, great. Very shortly, the, the black box problem is a really difficult problem. It won't be solved in a, in a day. Uh, the, the way to do that, instead of trying to read everything inside the system, the way I interact with Andrew is I don't look at his neurons and the structure directly. Uh, that would be nice. Maybe we'll find a technology does, that does that later. But for now, I would talk to him and try to understand and empathize with him. Uh, I think that's the way we could use to uh, transmit moral values, exchange moral values, uh, and, and control the ethical outcome of us as a group behaving together. I think that uh, one of the places this comes in sharp focus is where decisions are being made that affect someone else's freedom. So therefore in legal decision making and so on. And a starting point is to remember that the machine doesn't have to be perfect, that's not achievable, but it might have to be at least as good as humans. And it's like, you know, the, 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 the story of the two guys in, in the savannah. Uh, and there's a lion that's about to attack them, and one of them is putting his, uh, his trainers on, and the other one says, it's no good putting your shoes on, you can't outrun a lion. And he says, I don't have to outrun a lion, I just have to outrun you. And the machine, uh, the, the bar we should be setting is, is it more consistent than a human? And if I can illustrate this from the UK, in uh, 2009, there was a major uh, parliamentary debate and decision to address what had been recognized as inconsistencies of uh, sentencing amongst judges. In the UK, it was known as a postcode lottery. In America, I think it'd be called a zip code lottery. And, and people were finding that what sentence you might get for a given set of um, circumstances and so on seemed to depend on who the judge was and even the geographical area. As a result of which, in uh, 2020, uh, we actually had the uh, Sentencing Council for England and Wales set up with a rather algorithmic set of guidelines to try to introduce greater consistency in the sentencing for given um, criminal activities that were, people were found to be guilty of. Now, it seems to me that even if we're not yeah, that, there yet, it may well be that the machines would be better at giving more consistent sentencing than humans, or at least could give the humans considerable assistance in doing that, recognizing that any decision that affects someone else's freedom has got to be open to challenge uh, and appeal. I think that a theme that I'm discovering is one between basically fear and careful thinking. So I think that at the very beginning of this sort of discussion of AI and the singularity, um, we have odd statements by, for instance, Ray Kurzweil, who manages to frame himself as being very not worried about AI risk while also saying that AI will probably kill us all. And almost everyone seems to interpret him as saying we shouldn't worry about it. And he does specifically say that there is a subtle argument that he doesn't spell out for why we shouldn't worry about it. And nonetheless, Bill Joy freaked out and worried about it, and then many other people did. And um, it seems like there is a like subtext that we have a great deal of difficulty escaping when trying to discuss things of importance in general, which seems to like, we would like to create a dichotomy between bad decisions made from fear and good decisions made from careful thinking. But there seem to be like cultural constraints that make it very hard if we want to call for good decisions. Uh, we seem to find our possible, our set of options reframed as be afraid or ignore it, rather than definitely don't be afraid and definitely don't ignore it, but think. So I think that a lot of these problems with the long term would probably be solved pretty easily if we were even trying to solve them. But it's very hard to try to solve problems in the long term, and we should ideally become like curious about how we can make it easy instead. Okay, so this is great. And I want to pull Surya in and play the devil's advocate here and sort of draw from a bunch of threads that have been coming up in this conversation. Okay, so, so far in this conversation, we've identified a number of potential issues 
concerning how to get there from here, okay? And bearing in mind that, you know, we don't want to lapse into a discussion of how long and what year this is. I mean, that, that's so tiring, painful. But, I mean, we've identified a bunch of issues that are already coming up, right? So there's the black box problem. There's the problem of attention that Syria pointed out. There is also the problem of technological unemployment, which is a real big issue, especially if self-driving cars actually happen on, in a timely fashion, right? I really hope they don't, because the whole reason I bought my Tesla is to go really fast, and I think they're going to stop letting people speed. So, I mean, I'm hoping it's real slow. Um, there are other problems as well, um, but let's focus on these, and now let me play devil's advocate. Okay, so, suppose I'm Elon Musk or Ray Kurzweil, and I'm planning how to deal with a variety of problems like this, and I say to myself, oh, there's a simple solution. Enhance humans. Then we don't have to worry about these awful attentional bottlenecks, do we? Because we can enhance human attention, and we can deal with the control problem because we can keep up with artificial intelligence as it becomes super intelligent because we'll be super intelligent and we can deal with the black box issue because we can understand the processing of these systems because we're as smart as them. What do you think? Um, I'm skeptical. Uh, it, it may be easier to to invent smarter AI than to enhance humans. Um, I, I think these, like, I, I actually don't think technology will be the solution to our ills. I think a, a marriage between technology and humanism will be essential to navigating the, the transients that we're going to be facing, you know, in the next 20, 30 years. Um, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Like, one thing that we're doing at Stanford is we created a new human-centered AI institute where it's kind of focused along three pillars, right? One is trying to create better AI technology inspired by the power, flexibility, and robustness of human thought. The second pillar is AI, better AI for humanity, specifically applications where venture capitalists and companies would fear to tread. So for example, they're using AI to resettle refugees in places where they'll maximize their chances for employment. You know, that's an example. Or AI for third world development, Right, a, a very underserved sector of our, of our planet. Uh, so that's one, another pillar. And the third pillar, which is germane to this conversation, is guiding and studying the impact of AI in society. And so we're bringing in economists, political scientists, philosophers, historians, right? We're having a historian work with a machine learning person to understand the sources of bias in data itself across the centuries by looking at textual analysis. They're finding really interesting things. The computer scientists guided by the historian is thinking about how to de-bias the data. Um, we have a, um, a social scientist thinking about the question that you raised. What are our human values and why are we here? How can we create a new moral political economy that will serve humans going forward when humans don't necessarily have to work? Right? How do we do that? That's a human question. Technology is irrelevant. That's a question about why do we exist? How do we want to organize our society? Th these are the things we're doing locally where I am, and, and I, I, I vote with my feet. I think that's the way we should go. I, I don't think, think sci-fi uh, stuff about enhancing humans is, that's not a solution to the problems that we're gonna be facing. Yes, Olaf. I, I agree with a lot, of, a lot of that, but I think, aren't we already augmented? Um, if you remove this phone from my hand, you heard this a thousand times, so I'm so sorry about this, but if you remove this and you hide it, I will feel like I'm not human anymore. I feel like you chopped my arm off. This is part of my extended cognition. And we couple with any tool we use, uh, want it or not, and of course there are different types of tools. There are telescopes that allow us to, to see better in the future uh, or uh, in the past. And uh, there, are, there are other types that uh, act and are autonomous. And, and, and both of those actually modify us uh, in a deep, uh, in a very deep way. Those, those actually augment us, I think. Now, 
the way, well, uh, I saw the, the tweet by uh, Fei Fei Li uh, on, uh, about the, the, the new uh, human institute uh, on, on AI. I think to make it human is exactly what I was trying to suggest before. I don't know if I'm right, but I think that we can couple, we can loosely couple with any kind of uh, technology and communicate our goals. And that seems very promising to me. I, uh, if, if Martin... Uh, Rees were here, he would be talking about the possibility of um, bits of science being too hard for a human to get their mind around it, um, unaided by uh, machine learning. I'm not sure about that, but I recognize the validity of, of thinking about that. Humans have uh, co-evolved with, with crops and with animals for many, many years. So for a moment, you could think of um, the co-evolution of humans and AI. And it's obvious that AI is evolving. I think uh, we've, we've learned quite a lot about that in the last day or two. If it's just straight Darwinian evolution, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years, not very much. But uh, gene synthesis is proceeding at such a pace that it may be that with if we were having a discussion like this 10 years from now, we'll be talking about um, gene synthesis. And what's that going to be doing to humans? Companies like Evenetics in the UK are now bringing ever closer the day when you can synthesize a human length genome with sufficient accuracy to be useful. And of course, we're getting better and better also at understanding how factors in the genome affect um, the, the phenotype. And Although the technology is completely different from AI, nevertheless, the deeper we go, the more we may find ourselves addressing the sort of question that you said, well, what are we trying to do? What does it mean for humans to flourish? If we had control over the human genome, what ought we be to be doing with that kind of capability? And so how we interact with AI is a question in itself, but I think we should see it in the context of these other questions of technological and societal changes that are taking place. I wanted to just make a little pitch for how much all of you sitting here in the room can contribute to this, because for two reasons. Both, of course, as Suri I mentioned, these basic human questions about what kind of future we want, what we want it to mean to be human is something you should all be thinking about. And then also specifically, we physicists and, and others who work in adjacent nerdy fields, I think can contribute to this in, in, really in two ways. One is um, in, the, in this trade-off between short-term stuff and long-term stuff that you mentioned. I think the nerds in the room are pretty good at that, right? Should you in the past have spent all your money on building CERN, even though it wouldn't give results for decades? Or should you give away all the funding to PI grants that would start paying off almost immediately, like FQXI grants, right? Well, we chose a balanced portfolio, did both. And I think we can, can hopefully persuade the world that the same should be done here. Invest long-term in the control problem and at the same time tackle the, the, the short-term issues. And finally, we can all contribute to the nerdy stuff. Because I think it's, it can't be emphasized enough what you said. There are really important technical problems here, how you make your machine understand our goals, adopt them, retain them, and so on. And it might take decades to solve them. And there are few people who are better equipped to find those solutions than you. So, Hi, Dominic Shasvaranek. Um, I wonder if you could build an AI to understand other AI, what they are doing. Uh, AIs have actually communicated with each other and they've created a language that nobody else can understand. And they shut off the program, right? They got, the people doing it got freaked out and shut it off? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so that, that example doesn't, doesn't show that they understand what the other one was Good. doing, uh, rather the opposite of that. <laughs> but uh, I think that, that, that hasn't been done and, and I think we should work on that. Maybe, maybe one way uh, to work on that would be to work on credit assignment, which is uh, a question that is uh, solved very trivially in differentiable uh, learning and less trivially uh, for uh, reinforcement because 
well, uh, well we, we don't have a unified framework to, to think about credit assignment, essentially. And I think we should have this formal uh, framework to solve that. That would help uh, to, to, to solve your question. I think a great project would be like a, a society of networks, right, that are all trained to solve a certain problem, but they also have to communicate with each other, and communication is the key to solving the problem. So they're very active communicating can somehow hopefully would regularize their internal representations so that they're easier to understand, not only for the other networks, but also for humans inspecting them. Um, you know, I, I think that would be, that'd be a very interesting project. To, to my knowledge, no one has accomplished something like that. So it seems a little bit anthropomorphic to me intuitively to talk about an AI and another AI. Like, I do think one thing that Musk has more or less correct is that when dealing with humans, we have these very large gaps between the bandwidth internal to our brain and the bandwidth between people. And so there is like two issues. One is alignment of motives and the other is um, something, two issues, one is basically alignment of motives and one is like bandwidth that get conflated when you are a human that aren't necessarily conflated if you're talking about an AI. So like, I feel like when you're talking about things that have aligned motives because they weren't built to have oppositional motives and which also have high bandwidth, it's kind of unnatural to think of them as being two different things. And like when you're talking about a bunch of things that are allocating credit without expectations of internal conflict over how the credit is allocated, but totally collaboratively, you might not find it natural to call them different things. Like, when you, when you have an evolutionary algorithm, do you think of the AI as one thing, or do we think of all of the different sub-programs as competing things, you know? How do we know we can control or understand if we have e e AIs communicating that they won't get into camps and go to war versus cooperate. We, it sounds like you were touching on some of that and you had some beliefs, but I don't know, we're pretty good as humans at realizing all kinds of different sorts of relationships. And my guess is if AIs are complicated, they could as well. Sure, yeah. Um, did anybody want to feel that or I can, I mean, I, I think th these things are sort of not even known unknowns yet. Um, you know, as AIs get extremely smart, like I look forward to hanging out with the game theorists over at the Woodrow Wilson School who deal with nukes. Uh, the singularity will be about an AI with a, as an agent with a will, but actually it may be creeping up in entirely different ways. I mean, Google uh, is an enveloping information system that we all use every day and it uses all sorts of methods of organizing inf information. And when something is good enough that it's easier to use it to find a document than it is to, for me to look for it on my desk, I can find it amongst all the billions of the world's documents. I think that's getting pretty intelligent. And we may see, th there may be, is, could there be a singularity from AI agents without any wills or motives? So the Vinci and singularity that I discussed is pretty much a singularity without machine intelligence in a sense different from the sense in which we actually do have machine intelligence. It's the sort of thing you're talking about. So people have definitely been thinking about that. And when there's this interview that I like between Larry Page, uh, Sergey Brin, and Vinod Kosla from 2014, where Kosla is talking about the need for a basic income, which is certainly something that we should probably have, but due to machine automation. And Brin tries a few times to focus the conversation on the fact that we already automated most of the jobs, and that we're like already in a world where, for the most part, human values are not guiding what we're doing, and we have no idea what's going on. And maybe we should try to fix that, but he find, he finds his partic the other participants kind of derailing that conversation, and he eventually gives up on it. But certainly a really important question. I mean, I love AI, and I feel that I'm going to be a winner. But has anyone done the calculation to figure out whether actually it's a win for the world if we have more AI? I mean, it's coming. We know it's coming, but you know, what about everyone else? Uh, what is the calculation? Andrew, great question. I love that question, Pauline. I, I, 
perhaps it's the one we should end on. And um, there is no one thing called human values. Human values is something we have to work at. It's something we can legitimately disagree about. I hope we learn to disagree well. And uh, I hope that, that through that kind of process, we can arrive at uses of AI that do indeed make the world a better place. On that note, I'd like to thank the speakers for their insights. All right.